Today in Stronger Than Reason, we get provocative with industrial pioneers Coil and their second album, Horse Rotor Vader. Welcome to Stronger Than Reason. So, let's talk about art. There are a lot of good things about it. The Oxford English Dictionary defines art as the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Art is also useful in that it acts as a level of indirection for the human experience. In other words, instead of communicating your thoughts and feelings and perceptions directly, you can convey them indirectly through your art. For example, rather than drop an anvil on someone, you might create a series of whimsical cartoons about anvils falling on someone, thereby delivering the gist of your idea without actually killing anyone, not to mention saving a fortune on anvils. So through art, we can more safely explore a wider scope of situations, feelings, desires, and fears than we could achieve in a first-hand way. This sort of communication is essential to us as social creatures because art is a way for us to share a vast array of experiences with one another in a subtle and profound way. Of course, music is art as well, and much like the visual arts, it can either be designed to be familiar, falling into common conventions and styles like, say, rock and roll or modern country or jazz or rap, or it can be designed to achieve some other purpose to challenge, provoke, to confuse the listener, or to get them into a desired headspace, or maybe for ritual purposes, for religious or otherwise, or to push a boundary of some kind. And there are all kinds of boundaries in music. The very styles I was just listing, for instance, are all boundaries of a sort, and it's common to merge or blend styles to break new sonic ground or to merely try to defy categorization. There are boundaries in listener expectations. Maybe you didn't realize that most pop music written in the last 80 years uses just three or four chords per song, with each song arranged in a very predictable verse-chorus-verse format. These are the so-called golden rules of pop, and for decades, if you wanted to have your music on the radio, you had to strictly adhere to them. And some musicians would buck against those patterns. Uh, jazz comes to mind and progressive rock bands come to mind here. And there are also boundaries of, in subject matter, in instrumentation, in tone, or even in tempo. Some 300 BPM speed core, anyone? So sometimes this other purpose music gets tagged with this label experimental, meaning we don't really know what bin to put it in at the National Record Mart. Personally, I think experimental as a label is pretty useless because depending on your grasp of the scientific method, we can consider nearly any music to be experimental because nearly every band I've talked about on here has pushed boundaries in some way, whether it's Skinny Puppy sampling more than anyone else or Jandek releasing more music per unit of time than anyone else or even New Order trying to get sequencers to play the encore so they could hide in the dressing room and drink the rider. Now, industrial music, in particular, overlaps significantly with experimental music. Because as a rule, the farther back you go into industrial's history, the more experimental it gets. And it's not necessarily just noise and hollering, though that is sometimes true. It's that the music is just harder to characterize. It's less predictable. Some of it can be quite pretty and catchy and not at all like you might stereotypically think of as being industrial. So the album we're going to talk about today is one of these, and it's from a band that's intrigued me ever since my early days online when I would lurk on Rec Music Industrial, and I would listen to the old heads there talk about this band with reverence. After all, one of the band members was in the first industrial band, the one that coined the term by calling their label Industrial Records, and who first used the motto Industrial Music for Industrial People, the one that were described by the British Parliament as Wreckers of Civilization. <laughs> 
And they were the root from which sprung, to some extent, most of the bands I've been talking about on this show. Of course, they were England's own Throbbing Gristle, who were active in the band from 1976 through their first hiatus in 1981. After which, the four members embarked on separate projects. Genesis P. Orridge and Peter Christofferson would go on to start a new band, Psychic TV, while Chris Carter and Cozy Fanny Tootie would form the synth-pop act Chris and Cozy. Now, much has been said about this quartet of artists, and rightly so. Throbbing Gristle itself, as a project, grew from an earlier project called Coom Transmissions, which I've talked about before, that's C-O-U-M. In a nutshell, it was a collective that did avant-garde and transgressive performance art, and their modus operandi was to provoke and they did that from their inception in 1969 through 1976, when Jen's focus turned to music and then to Throbbing Gristle. There is a fascinating documentary on Coom out on YouTube. It's called Other Like Me, and if they interest you at all, I encourage you to check it out. It will almost certainly give you a window into a world of intelligent people who see the world quite differently from how you and I see it. And you can understand a bit how what they were doing fit into the very peculiar times of the early 70s England environment and how what they were doing merged with punk to birth the music that we love. I just want to call out another thing here, and that is Peter Christofferson's day job, because he was not only a member of Throbbing Gristle and Psychic TV, but he was the third and final member of the acclaimed British design group Hypnosis, which of course was founded by Storm Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell, and which went on to much acclaim for their dozens of classic album covers, including all of the Pink Floyd records you'd care to think of, plus hundreds of others. Peter, who his friends called Sleazy, was also a videographer, and in his career would direct over 40 music videos, including several for Nine Inch Nails. And I just want to call that out, because I think his resume is pretty impressive. You wouldn't necessarily expect an experimental musician from the 70s to be so successful and prolific across so many different media, but he was a talented guy. If we now zoom in on Psychic TV, we see its founders Genesis P. Orridge and Alex Ferguson, joined by Peter Christofferson, and in time another guy, Jeff Rushton, who would soon change his name to John Balance. Now, Christofferson and Balance would soon split off from Psychic TV to form their own band, the one we're talking about today, and one that, like its parent bands, would go on to influence countless industrial rock and industrial dance acts of the 80s, 90s, and well into the 21st century. That band, of course, is Coil. Now, I could start at the beginning with their first EP, How to Destroy Angels, or their first LP, Scatology, but I'm not going to do that, because for me, my first taste of Coil came from their second album, and I remember the first time I saw it. I was in a record store in the city, and it was sitting there in the vinyl bin, and now I'm going to blow up the artwork here so we can discuss it a bit. The album was, of course, Horse Rotor Vader. Now, At this point, in 1992 or so, all I knew of the band was what I had read on Usenet, their general history and so forth, and a lot of that was captured in the old RMI fac. So I didn't know much, and that said, I do like puzzles, and this record posed an immediate puzzle. First of all, the name was very unusual, because I couldn't make any sense of it. What is a rotorvator, and what do horses have to do with it? And I didn't know what it meant, but it was intriguing, and I wanted to know more. I just I just needed some context. Fortunately, the cover of the record provided it, at least some of it anyway, and the block of text there at the bottom. And allow me to read it. It says, On the eve of the apocalypse, the air choked with horsehair, the four horsemen betray their steeds, slitting open the animal throats, and in doing so release the second great deluge, horse gore, infinite divisible split, and infinity of open sewers. The four then fashion an immense earth-moving device from the collective jawbones, the horse rotorvator, 
with which to plow up the waiting world. Rhoda turns through 180 degrees to Taro. Wheels replace horses, dark horses run, dark horses run deep, and hell is paved with horse flesh. We plow the fields and scatter our dead steeds on the land. Wow. So that simultaneously explained everything and nothing. <laughs> But for sure, you know, it's a Twilight fanfic that I wouldn't mind reading. Uh, I want to see this concept adapted into a 250-page graphic novel by Alan Moore and Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, it's definitely worth a 12-part dystopian miniseries on Amazon Prime. Come on, let's make this happen. Anyway, it is a compelling piece of poetry, evidently inspired by a dream that John Balance had in which he managed to wrap the biblical four horsemen around the idea of the esoteric Wheel of Fortune, and then threw in a John Carpenter flick for good measure. Not bad. But as a kid, you know, it intrigued me. And I wondered about the rest of the cover art, too, because it seemed to be a pleasant picture of a gazebo, backlit by the sun on what looks like a nice summer morning. But it turns out... <laughs> It turns out that that's a bit of dark humor, too, maybe, uh, since it's a photo of the bandstand at Regent's Park in London, which was where the Regent's Park bombings took place in 1982, just a few years before this album's release. So, not such a pleasant picture, after all, given that context. And another example of this band's subversive tendencies— and in this, Coyle may have taken a note from Throbbing Gristle's own third album, the wonderfully subversive 20 Jazz Funk Greats. <laughs> and I'll show the album cover here so you can fully appreciate how this title and packaging might lure in an entirely unsuspecting punter. Because trust me, this album contains nothing remotely like jazz funk. And, you know, the twist on the cover is when you realize the four band members are all posing on a bit of land called Beachy Head. And just past where they're standing is a sheer drop to the ocean. And as such, it's historically been one of England's top suicide spots. Again, not such a nice cover after all, huh? Anyway, I did not buy Horse Rotorvator that day since it was an expensive vinyl pressing. And uh, I didn't really own a record player at the time. But soon after that, I would stumble across this, the cassette version in my local used music store. And I would snap that up for a couple of bucks. Um, side note, it's interesting to me that they misspelled the damn album title here. <laughs> they spelled it with two R's, not three. Like you see on the actual cover up here. It's supposed to be R-O-T-O-R, -O -O and they don't have that down below. Uh, and they also screwed it up on the spine, too. Uh, fortunately, it's correct on the, the actual cassette. Uh, but shame, shame. Someone really dropped the ball there. Um, so I took this tape back to my dorm room at the time, and, you know, I fired it up. And what did I expect? Well, in 1992, my experience with so-called industrial was mostly with industrial rock. So bands like Skinny Puppy, Ministry, and Nine Inch Nails. So I figured Coil would lie in the noisier side of those bands. I imagine they'd be kind of like primitive Skinny Puppy with drum machines and shouting and banging and maybe some horror movie samples for ambience, but overall still groovy, still with a beat, something you could dance to. And when I listened to the first track, a charmingly titled number called The Anal Staircase, <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't immediately disappointed because it's a noisy but groovy track. It has a discernible beat. It has samples from Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, and it was surprisingly catchy. And I thought, ah, you know, I wasn't too far off. It's pop music, but it's abrasive pop music. And I figured the title of the song was just, you know, sort of a band pass filter meant to weed out anyone who was overly sensitive. But The Anal Staircase is a wild song. I'd argue it's a good song and one that would very well fit on a mid-80s skinny puppy album, say. But it did seem that there was something maybe more dangerous about it, because what is it really talking about? <laughs> you know, the lyrics. I found myself, you know, just a, a bit uncomfortable. Is this a song about 
perversion? And if it is, and if I like the song, what does that say about me? So, you know, it did elicit a response that I wasn't used to. And I think that response of discomfort was something that Coyle was very, very good at, something that they adapted from Peter's years in TG and Coombe, just a way of provoking the listener. And, you know, that's the thing about Coyle in general that I've found is that there's always something about them that's a little unconventional, that defies standards and mores, and you're always left wondering, do they really mean it or is it all just part of the act? And Another small example, there's a video with a band from 1986 or so when this album came out. You can freely search for it. It's called The Sound of Progress. And it starts with the three then members, John, Peter, along with Stephen Thrower, having dinner around a table. And Peter pops a bottle of champagne. He pours it around. And then he just digs into a whole chicken face first, just <laughs> just stuffing it in his face. <laughs> You know, really snorkeling into this chicken, going so far as to then stick his greasy fingers into John's mouth. So, you know, there's there's always something just a little bit uh, off-putting and unexpected in whatever it is they're doing. Anyway, you wind up with a song like The Anal Staircase, and it's probably not a song that's going to appear on American Top 40 anytime soon. And, you know, listening to it back then, you know, I could... See why Horse Rotor Vader was one of Trent Reznor's favorite albums. It, it's an album that doesn't have just one sound. Uh, nearly every song is really its own thing, its own mood. And the sound design on this record is really off the hook. And from what I understand, Peter Christofferson leased a Fairlight CMI to make this record. The Sound of Progress documentary shows him working on it, coming up with a beat. So... There's a lot of sampling going on with this record. And as you know, a sample-heavy record immediately has a much wider sonic palette than one using conventional instruments, because anything is game, anything at all. And he took advantage of that. And also, I've caught some interviews with Peter where he's discussed his theory of composition. And I'd like to just paraphrase it here. First of all, he says, if you want to be a musical pioneer, you have to abuse your equipment. Using it as intended is just a non-starter. In fact, he said there is nothing worse than presets, and he can't understand why any band would buy a keyboard and just use the sounds right out of the box, or why anyone would even want to listen to that. And he went on to say that the technology itself really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're using a keyboard or a computer or a bank of old 8-track tapes that you've soldered together. All of that stuff can and should be abused. And if you're not making that abuse part of your process, you're not going to innovate, period. Second, he said that it's really important to make music that means something to you. You don't have to say what that meaning is. You just have to have it mean something to you. And then when you perform it, that conviction will come through. Listeners can hear it, that intent that you have, and that's what draws them in. So in short, if you're not interested the listener is not going to be interested. And there are just a million interviews of Peter online if you'd like to know how Coil did, what they did, and how they achieved these unusual pieces of music. And so I encourage you to check that out. I think you'll find that for being a subversive audio terrorist, Peter's actually a pretty soft-spoken, thoughtful guy with a healthy sense of humor. Go figure. Although, uh, I noticed that when John Balance is around, Peter tends to be the quiet one. But yeah, Trent Reznor likes this album. And no wonder, it does sound like outtakes from the downward spiral. And just as a reminder, Trent was pretty involved with Coil. Uh, He not only signed them to his own Nothing Records imprint, but he encouraged them to heavily remix his stuff. And their mixes appear on Fixed, on the Closer single, on Further Down the Spiral... Peter, of course, directed some Nine Inch Nails videos, including Wish and the long-form Broken film. And, of course, Trent and his wife, Mara Queen Mandig, later formed a band called How to Destroy Angels, named, of course, for Coyle's first EP, which, by the way, was a piece of ritual music for the accumulation of male sexual energy. (laughs) And they didn't hide that at all. In fact, it's right there in big type on the cover 
along with an extensive manifesto. And it's an interesting read. I'm not going to read it here, but I encourage you to check it out. And think about a band that's willing to put so much right out there on their first release in plain text. And speaking of, I should point out that John and Peter were openly gay in a time when that was risky for various reasons. And I don't normally bring up an artist's sexual orientation because I think it's usually irrelevant, but I feel like I have to in this case because being gay was just a big part of Coyle's identity, almost as much as as them being occultists. And so, yeah, gay occultists making challenging, boundary-pushing experimental music, you might say that they were the moral majority's worst nightmare. (laughs) And maybe... They would have been if they had gotten more popular, but Coyle never really saw mainstream success. Their association with Nine Inch Nails probably brought them the most name recognition. Maybe that and their 1985 cover of Tainted Love, which twisted the song around into a topical commentary about the AIDS epidemic. And it gave them some notoriety, if not notability. Those are two very different things. And I want to point out that they donated profits from that single to AIDS research, and now that release is considered the very first AIDS benefit record. But, you know, I just got to hand it to them for being themselves. Um, And I also just got to say that I'm not really down with the whole occult thing. I'm pretty much a hard-nosed rationalist. I don't believe in alchemy, unless you're talking about the strong nuclear force. I don't believe in fortune-telling or ley lines or ritualistic energy or crystals or anything supernatural. Personally, I think these are all stories we tell ourselves for various reasons, maybe to make us feel special or to make us feel powerful in a universe that, let's face it, seems incomprehensibly vast and which seems 100% indifferent to the goings-on down here on this tiny piece of dirt. So when John is singing about all this occult stuff, it's nothing at all I glom onto, uh, except in the same sort of way that I can appreciate, I don't know, like Halloween decorations or the band Ghost and so forth. I just mostly consider it a load of bollocks. But that's just me. I'm much more of the mind of folks like Carl Sagan, James Randi, and Martin Gardner, and even... Penn and Teller, people who go out of their way to debunk mystical and pseudoscientific bullshit. In fact, I'd like to do an episode on Sagan's book, The Demon Haunted World, which is maybe the most concise statement about the value of critical thinking I've ever read. Critical thinking, something that's pretty hard to achieve when people just want to believe. When blind faith offers an easy explanation, it's just so much simpler than asking for receipts. So yeah, in terms of the X-Files, I am not a believer. I don't want to believe. But I do think the truth is out there, and I'm convinced the best way to find it is by using the scientific method. Otherwise, you're just kidding yourself or deluding yourself, which might feel good, but as Richard Feynman himself once pointed out, Mother Nature cannot be fooled. Anyway... There are a few more ingredients that went into Coyle's stew pot in this record, but I think the best way to dig into those will be to consider each track. So let's do that. There we go. So we already talked about the first track, The Anal Staircase, but again, the production is so key here. The bombastic orchestral hits, the creepy samples of laughing, the horn stabs, the chimes... And then John's vocal, it's very noisy, it's claustrophobic, it's driving. Again, not so unlike Skinny Puppy at the time. I think it's a compelling lead-off track. Thematically, it's about putting yourself on a slippery slope, an urge or a compulsion that you cannot control. And they kind of underline that point with the final sample, which is one of the maybe few moments of levity in this whole album, which is where one kid is saying, get off me, you punk. And the other kid just says, no. (laughs) So yeah, on to track two, which is called Silk here on my cassette, but it's called Slur on all the other formats for whatever reason. Uh, This is a very unusual track. It has a shuffle beat. It's really atmospheric. Uh, It's definitely not industrial rock, but it's catchy. It's not immediately recognizable as any particular genre. To me, it kind of sounds theatrical 
like it's from some dark musical off, off, off Broadway. Uh, it sounds to me kind of like show music, very evocative. It has some reverbed out string samples that just give it a tremendous space. And John does get some support on here from a lady singing backup vocals. So an interesting little tune. Definitely not something that Skinny Puppy would have done. So this puts some light between Coil and the rest of the world. And then the next track is called Baby Lero. It's a really short interstitial piece that just features a lady singing in Spanish. Uh, don't have much to say about it, although the end does have a dog barking. So that puts it in the same bucket as Pink Floyd's Seamus and Jane's Addiction's Been Caught Stealing. <laughs> I do like how it segues seamlessly into the next song because it reminds you that this is not a collection of songs. It's just an entire suite. It's a puzzle that all fits together. So track four is called Ostia, and it's a pretty heavy number. It's very dark, again, very atmospheric. It's driven by what sounds like a harpsichord with violin accompaniment, uh, or both bowing and playing at pizzicato. So it's a quite beautiful string arrangement, really, and it builds and releases tension as you're listening to the song. Again, very cinematic. This is not industrial music at all as I knew it at the time. It's actually music that your grandmother would recognize as such. And I think the experimental aspect that comes in is just Coyle's willingness to explore different musical styles like this. You know, they're not patently alternative or edgy in terms of the music. However, it is very edgy in terms of the lyrics and themes because this song is subtitled The Death of Pasolini, referring to the Italian filmmaker and poet Pier Paolo Pasolini, who in 1975 was murdered under mysterious circumstances in the Roman neighborhood of Ostia. So Pasolini was a colorful but very contentious character, controversial even. I will leave investigating his long-storied history up to you. I'm not going into it here, and I am not going to try to defend this guy because I think he had some pretty unhealthy appetites. And all I'll say is that, per the original discussion at the top of this episode, he pushed the boundaries of what was considered art. You know, maybe like Throbbing Gristle, someone considered him to be a wrecker of civilization and acted accordingly. It's hard to say. Again, the circumstances of his death are mysterious. But the lyrics also refer to someone named Leon, and John Balance has gone on record saying that Leon was a friend of the band who likewise died mysteriously. So he's tying these two concepts together. And at 6 minutes and 20 seconds, this is the longest song on the album, making it something of the centerpiece. I find it to be moving and darkly pretty, if that is such a thing. Now, my cassette calls the next song Acapulco March, but all the other formats call it Herald, H-E-R-A-L-D. So... I don't know why it was so hard for them to get the track listing right on this cassette. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's part of the album's allure. Anyway, this song is just a recording of a marching band, peppily banging away, only for Peter to detune them in uncomfortable and disturbing ways. So it's really short, just about a minute or so long, and I don't know, but it might also be a nod to the cover art, you know, the bandstand from the Regent's Park bombing. And that leads directly to the next track, which is Penetralia, which sounds like something that Paul Barker might have thrown together for a Lead Into Gold album. And it's got a big gated beat with chugging guitar through which the band weaves crazy saxophone lines and samples. And really, this is what I thought the whole album would be when I first put it on. Kind of swans-like early sludge metal, but... There are some nice production touches. There's this crazy kill switch effect. There's lots of percussive effects. It gets really noisy at the end. But, you know, it's nothing that would put off anyone familiar with mid-90s ministry. So altogether, you know, a nice beefy song. And my cassette here skips the next track, which is on every other format. It's a piece called Ravenous. Uh, it's a weird instrumental Something that might play over the end credits of a Fellini film, maybe. <laughs> uh, or maybe a Monty Python film. 
And if I'm making a lot of film references here, it, it's because to me this music is very cinematic. I think it would accompany video very well. But to my knowledge, the band made no promo videos for any of these songs. So the next track is uh, Circle of Mania, which throws you off by being a jazzy, snappy little number <laughs> with a shuffle beat and horn stabs. In fact, it's just a few finger snaps away from being a tune by the Stray Cats. And then, of course, the lyrics take it in a completely different direction. Uh, the title is a clue, but it's another Pasolini reference, which I'd rather not go into. <laughs> This record really does sound like a soundtrack to a sex and horror exploitation flick, like the Rocky Horror Picture Show, or Repo, the genetic opera. Um, John gives just a great vocal on this track, and I think your level of comfort with it might depend on the extent to which you think he's playing a role versus being sincere. So it's hard to say which it is here. Uh, I kind of think maybe they were interested in keeping that line intentionally fuzzy. Next up, a nice little ditty called Blood from the Air. <laughs> so this is a, a mood piece with very few drums and John relaying scenes from one of his dreams. It gets really noisy in the middle, but is otherwise restrained, orchestral, just strings and synths with John's vocal. But the thing that really sticks out to me is this sound effect through the end of the song. And it really does sound like blood falling from the air. Not rain, but blood. And... The title, I guess, just welded that image into my brain, so to me it sounds a bit gross, but you have to really hand it to Peter then on the sound design there, because it's really effective. And next up, of all things, you have a Leonard Cohen cover, you know, as you do. In this case, his song, Who by Fire, from his 1974 album, New Skin for the Old Ceremony. And, you know, here I was thinking the song was a tie-in to The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, but no! Instead, it enumerates various causes of death. See? Really uplifting, really. <laughs> you know, and one hopes Coyle sent Leonard Cohen royalties, and one hopes Leonard Cohen was suitably confused and or horrified. But two more tracks. The first is called The Golden Section, and it's a longish dirge of a track that starts with a disturbing sample that might be either horses galloping or possibly someone chewing hard to say uh, and then it turns into kind of an old school biblical epic uh, incidental music for a recital of sorts and it's got a stuffy British voice telling us about all the various aspects of the angel of death and I gotta say I'm less enamored with this track I think it drags on a bit and is fairly repetitive music wise and it just kind of goes around in circles for a bit which brings us to the final track the first five minutes after death. And I guess just from that title alone, we're due for another slow dirge. And what do you know? We're right, uh, at least for the first minute or so. And then it kicks into a slightly higher gear. But, you know, forgive me. But at this point in the program, all I can think of is that episode of The Simpsons when March appears in the production of A Streetcar Named Desire. And she's flying across the stage, suspended from a rope with lights blinking on and off, and Lisa's explaining that it symbolizes her character's descent into madness. And that's what this track sounds like to me. It's an instrumental, it's more about sound design than musical ideas, in my opinion, and it's Coyle constructing a synthetic environment in your headphones. World building, as it were. And that's cool for what it is, but I don't find it incredibly gripping, but it does take this album out perhaps all the way to the very bottom of the downward spiral. So that's the album, generally 12 tracks, unless you've got the cassette, like me, and are missing ravenous. God forbid. So, why do I love Horse Rotor Vader? Um, I do find it evocative in a way that more genre-ish albums are not. Uh, I think it's something of a puzzle, and uh, it's definitely more truly avant-garde than other music I listen to. I find it daring. I find it transgressive. I find it challenging, yet is also very listenable. It's not, not like a destructive or harmful record. It's still kind of uplifting in its own strange way. 
And, you know, while you don't necessarily want to have a, an experience with a piece of art that is harmful, it is sometimes good if art pushes you out of your safe space and it makes you work for that dopamine reward. And I also like that this album is hard to categorize. I think it's a bit all over the map. I like to think that Coyle's approach here greatly informed Nine Inch Nails records post Broken and, you know, other bands as well. Maybe the likes of Tool and Radiohead, bands that like to dabble with progressive elements and overall concepts and bands that move music in general away from radio hits and stadium anthems, shifting it from genre music to program music and getting to an altogether different level of self-expression. Um, it, this record reminds me that there is power, after all, in not giving the fans what they want, in doing the unexpected, in leading folks somewhere new instead of giving them more of the same. I think Coil were always a dynamic force in the alternative music scene. I think they always pushed the frontier in composition, sampling, timbre, mood, video, and even live presentation, because they were the whole package. They were true artists, and Horse Rotor Vader is an early encapsulation of all of that. And that's why I love it. So what happened next? Well, this was their second full-length album. It came after the How to Destroy Angels EP and their first album, Scatology, which, despite the title, was actually about alchemy and did, in fact, feature a photo on the cover that might be construed as an anal staircase. I'll leave that up to the listener to investigate as you see fit. But in 1987, they would follow up uh, Horse Rotor Vader with a companion album of sorts. It was composed of outtakes and alternate versions from those sessions, plus some new material. And following the alchemical theme, they called it Gold is the Metal with the Broadest Shoulders. Now, I did once own this disc on CD back in the day, but something about it really put me off, and I'm not going to get into that. Let's just say that I found myself really wanting to get rid of it, which I did by selling it to a guy uh, not far down the road from me. Uh, musically, though, I found it not as engaging as Horse Rotor Vader. It was far noisier, and really, I wasn't looking for noisy back in the day. I was really just looking for a good beat, as I explained many times. Having a copy of Horse Rotor Vader was good enough for me. Although I did pick this up, the unreleased themes from Hellraiser, it also came out in 1987 and was highly sought after back in the day, and I was lucky enough to come across this in the used bins, misfiled. And I do love the cover art, which either shows an angel or a skull, depending on your perspective. Um, what happened here was that Clive Barker commissioned Coyle to make music for the first Hellraiser film, but for whatever reason, uh, decided not to use it. So the band just decided to release it themselves. And I remember some friends of mine back in the day checking this disc out. Uh, friends who were by no means into alternative music, although they were familiar with the film. And uh, they love this quote by Clive Barker here in the liner notes. He said, The only group I've heard on disc whose records I've taken off because they make my bowels churn. <laughs> Yeah, so that about summed up this record all right. Um, this disc may have been hard to get, but the band did collect all these tracks onto their Unnatural History albums, so you can pretty easily find them today. Um, their next album, though, the fourth one, would change their sound entirely and would bring them to a somewhat wider audience, and that record would be Love's Secret Domain, which they released in 1991 during the peak of club culture. But that's an album we'll talk about some other day. And of course, they would release tons of music into the following several decades. So where are they now? Well, John and Peter, alas, are no longer with us. John Balance died in 2004 at the young age of 42 from what you might call misadventure. It was a very unlucky and sad thing. Just terrible that he was so young. And after that, Peter Christofferson curated and released a couple posthumous Coil albums, but mostly spent his time reuniting with Throbbing Gristle until his similarly untimely death in 2010 at the age of just 
1955, bringing Coil as a project to a firm close. But in all, they released a tremendous number of studio albums, not to mention side projects and compilations. Uh, As a band, they had many phases to their career and explored a variety of different styles. And even though they both died relatively young, they left plenty of music out there to keep any budding Coil fan busy for a lifetime. Well, there you have it, folks. A timeless bit of classic industrial Coil's horse rotor vader. But rest assured, no actual horses were harmed in the making of this record. A member of the ASPCA was in the studio at all times. You're listening to Stronger Than Reason either on YouTube or as an Apple or Spotify podcast, the show that's just glad to see the sun again, frankly. For a while there, I wasn't sure it was ever coming back. No kidding. When it finally came out a few days ago, I just went outside and stared around for about five minutes. I could feel the vitamin D come flowing back into my bloodstream. And then there was this collective hum around town, the sound of a thousand lawnmowers firing up at once. And my own grass was about a foot high, but I managed to mow it along with dozens of softball-sized mushrooms. But, you know, overall, overall, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, Lots of folks did not have such an easy time out of the last few weeks. And by all accounts, storm season here in the U.S. is not yet over. There's another one brewing up in the Gulf right now. So do what you can for your neighbors, folks. Check on one another. If you can manage it, donate some bucks to storm recovery efforts because that's how we're going to get through this thing, by having each other's backs. As always, thanks for listening, and until next time, stay strong.